Welcome to the Five Rivers Podcast. For more information, head to fiveriverschurch.com. We now join our services already in progress. morning. Welcome to Five Rivers this morning. So great to see everybody. Those of you at home, thank you for joining us this morning. No matter where you are, whether we're in person, whether we're online, let's all stand together. Let's give him our praise this morning. Hallelujah. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall, we'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you, oh, let faith be a song that overcomes the raging sea, let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me, let it rise, let faith arise. Watch the giants fall, for fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. This is what freedom feels like. 
This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, oh, one we more praise time. you. Oh, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. Come on, sing it out. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, yes, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy.
sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessing all mine with ten thousand besides more time. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song must end and you never do so i throw up my hands and praise you again and again because all that i have is a hallelujah hallelujah and i know it's not much but I've nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah, Hallelujah I've got one response I've got just one move with my arms stretched wide, I will worship. 
worship you. Oh, so I lift so I my, my hands, hands and praise you again and again. And again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, Nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Oh, come on, my soul Don't you get shy on me Lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the Lord come on oh, oh come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and oh, I know praise we've got this morning, right? up your song cause you've got a lion inside those lungs well, get up and praise the Lord so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Diane, you can keep on playing. Let's play through that chorus. Pastor, you, you and the elders can come up and start getting the set up for communion. But as we do that this morning, earlier we sang about, about this is what heaven sounds like. Right? This is what heaven sounds like, giving our praise to him. And then in this song, in the bridge, we say, you know, let's not get shy, our soul. Let's not get our soul shy. But let's sing out like a lion is inside of us at the top of our lungs. So here's what we're going to do. So we move into communion. I want to sing through this chorus one more time. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Diane's going to play lightly. But the, the vocalists, our team up here, myself, we're going to back away from the microphones right now. Because we're going to lift up our song to heaven this morning. Hallelujah. Let's lift up our song. So let's all sing that chorus together. No mics. A, an acoustic praise to him this morning. All right? And let's continue in worship, but you may be seated as the uh, ushers distribute the 
uh, communion elements. And I just want to say this before we get back into worship. Go ahead, guys. Um, listen, if there's sin in your heart, in your life, now's the time to repent of it. Get right with God. If, if there's discouragement, give it to the Lord. If there's pain in your heart today, give it to the Lord. Whatever, whatever uh, he can take care of better than anyone else, give that to the Lord today. All right, and hold the communion elements so we can all take them together in just a few moments. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. So
that's a good encouraging word to us. So if you come from a different tradition, I just want to help those that might be here or watching online. The scripture teaches us that, that the Lord gives his church many gifts. And among those gifts, especially the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, he will give some the gift of speaking in tongues and unknown language, gives the gift of interpretation. And during our time of worship, as we go into communion, the Lord has given us a good and encouraging word today. Maybe it's new to you, or maybe it's a reminder that you needed that you are redeemed and that we belong to the Lord. And the last thing we want to do is the word came forth is don't give yourself to this world. That's a good word, whether you've heard it for the first time today or the thousandth time. Don't be given to the world. You are the Lord's. You are the redeemed. And that's, that's what this time is all about, isn't it? And in thinking about our communion time today, you know, one of the big ideas, if you will, will in our world today is, is this... This ideology of progressive, progressivism. And it's even seeped into, into the church that in regards to what the church does and, and, and sin in the world, we, we've got to find some new way that has never been known to uh, address the issues of the heart and of life. We've got to find some new way, some new way we've never known. But Jesus said... And what we're about to do, do this in remembrance of me. And he is the once and for all sacrifice, Scripture teaches us. We don't need to be given, especially in this area, to something that has never been known. We better be given to some things we must never forget. And that is the life and the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must never forget them. We must never forget who he is. We must never forget what he has done. We must never forget the price that he paid when he laid down his life for your sins and for mine. Let's not be looking for some new way never known and be distracted from the way we must never forget. Always and forever. By the way, it says in the word, heaven and earth will pass away. That includes all of the new stuff, all of the progressivism, doesn't it? But what does he add to that? My word will never pass away. It's just as true today as it has ever been. As Jesus gathered around the table, the night of the Passover with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread is my body broken for you. And that's just as real today as it was the day he spoke it to his disciples. We are his disciples today. And we hold in our hands a piece of broken bread to remind us. And we believe that the presence of the Lord is with us. And as often as you eat of this bread, he said, you do so in remembrance of me, Jesus. Today we remember. We remember you. We remember your words. They are still the words of salvation and the words of life. Everything you ever did or said. And today, as you are here with us, we remember and we obey your word. And we're so grateful that you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take together. And after supper, he took the cup, and he says, this is the blood of a new covenant. Jesus has shed his blood for us, hasn't he? And it's the only way to have our sins washed away. And that's why I said earlier, if there's any sin in your heart, in your life, if there's any discouragement, if there's any pain, it, now's the time to give it to the Lord because there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus Christ. 
to wash it all away. Amen. Lord, you said as often as we drink of this cup, we do so in remembrance of you. And as referenced a moment ago, you are the once and for all sacrifice. There's no need for another way. There's no need for a better way because they don't exist. It's only through you and the blood that you shed on our behalf. And today, with hearts filled with gratitude, we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take together. Amen. Let's uh, continue in our worship time. And holy, we cry holy. Holy, we cry holy. Sing it together, holy. standing before we are seated it's just great to see everybody let's go ahead and greet each other this morning we're going to add something to this this morning okay so we say this and I've realized that I think that sometimes we neglect the people at home and I don't want to do that so those of you that are home and those of you that are here that know of somebody that's home or somebody that uh, maybe is away this week or whatever um, I want you in the midst of your greeting to send a text to somebody that is usually here, somebody that's watching online, um, or you can, you can comment in the chat or whatever you want to do, but send a text to somebody and give them a greeting this morning. You know, we can all use that encouragement at some point. Amen? So let's go ahead and add that to whatever greeting we have this morning as we move into our announcements and offering. Good morning, Five Rivers family. This Friday, August 11th, is the Crew Youth Back to School Backyard Bash at the home of Jason and Stacy Yates from 6 to 9 p.m. You can speak to Pastor Sam or any of the youth leaders for more information about this event. Ladies, remember to sign up for the annual Do Ministry Pool Party at the home of Amy Stevenson. It is August 20th, right after church that morning. Bring your favorite appetizer to share, your swimming suit, a towel, and a chair. It's always a great time of fellowship. There are still some spots available on the August 26th fishing trip for men and women. The cost is $120 per person, and you will meet at Five Rivers at 845 that morning. Please see Paul Benicki for more information or to sign up. Well, have a blessed week, family, and I'll see you next Sunday. Yes, you will. We will be here. That's for sure. 
Well, hey, it's been a great week uh, in Columbus, Ohio. We just got back yesterday from uh, National Youth Conference and Fine Arts and General Council of the Assemblies of God. So we got to hang out with 17,000 plus of our closest friends in Columbus, and if it, it was a wonderful time. And uh, our youth that had presentations and submissions got ratings, I believe, across the board of superiors and excellent, correct? For everything, whether it was spoken word, short sermon, t-shirt design, pictures, poems, uh, superiors and excellence across the board. So we're grateful for our youth. Amen. And I know Sydney, who is working hard on the switcher in the tech booth, put out a, a Facebook post. Today, if I understand correctly, is the last day to order one of your T-shirts that it was a superior rating, right? Uh, on, so you get a superior T-shirt when you uh, order, order that, and that will go to support crew youth. That is for sure. And, hey, in two years, August 5 through 8, Orlando, put it on your calendar, right? Come and join us at the next General Council slash Youth Conference and Fine Arts. The next, the next one is in Orlando, August 5 through 8, 2025. All right, and it's too hot down here. You can go to my place. No, uh, we'll probably be there. That's for sure. Well, listen, all this week, uh, we just heard amazing preaching. So I know that when Reverend Dr. Abraham Philip is going to speak, you're just going to continue that today. Listen, Abraham and Annie are such an incredible blessing, and his consistency in bringing a good word when he ministers the word of the Lord. We've prayed for an anointing on him this morning, but also on you and me to hear and to receive. So would you open your hearts, and let's welcome uh, our own dear brother Abraham Philip to the pulpit this morning. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you, Pastor, for that gracious introduction. Uh, I know you have heard some great preaching in Ohio, and I'm not sure if I'm worthy to fill any one of those shoes. And so keep me in your prayers that the Lord would uh, minister to you through the spoken word. I want to thank the Lord for this great opportunity that he has given to me this morning to be here and to minister the Word of God, and I want to thank Pastor Tucker for so graciously inviting me to fill in for him this morning. <clears throat> I'm so glad to be here, but you know, to be honest with you, at age 75, I am glad to be anywhere. <laughs> That's pretty much sums up my life, you know. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Philippians. <clears throat> For the last few weeks, we've been so blessed by the ministry of Pastor Tucker, who has been taking us through a beautiful journey through the book of Philippians. And I really thank the Lord for empowering our dear pastor, to do such a wonderful verse-by-verse -verse exposition of that beautiful book and to bring forth some very insightful thoughts. So I, for one, I can tell you for sure, I've been very blessed by the ministry of his servant. <clears throat> but this morning, for some reason, as I was praying and meditating a few weeks ago when he invited me to speak, I've been asking God to take me to a passage of scripture that is timely and that needs to be shared with, with the people of God. And so the Lord impressed upon my heart to read through the book of Philippians. As Pastor has indicated earlier in his uh, introduction of this book, and as all of you know, Philippians is generally considered by conservative scholars as a prison epistle because it was, according to some scholars, was written during Paul's first Roman imprisonment around 62 AD. 
and he was under house arrest for two years. And during that time, he was, most of the time, was chained to a Roman soldier. But at the same time, he had some freedom, some liberty, to be able to uh, receive guests and to share the gospel with them. And so during that time, while he was in that Roman house arrest or imprisonment, this is one of the letters that he wrote during that time. <clears throat> and as you read through this beautiful little book or little letter, and frankly, this is really a thank you letter. That's what it is. Because Paul wrote this to express his thankfulness, his appreciation for the financial gift that the church at Philippi gave to him to continue his ministry. So it's really a thank you letter. And as you read through this letter, what impresses you, or at least what impressed me, is how Paul brought forth the centrality of Christ in a believer's life. You know, in chapter 1, the key verse is, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And there you have the purpose for living. In chapter 2, the key verse is, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. There you have the pattern for living. In chapter 3, we read the key verse, I press toward the goal of the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And there you have the prize for living. And in chapter 4, the key verse is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And there you have the power for living. The purpose for living, the pattern for living, the price for living, and the power for living. And in this message, I want to focus on Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, and share a message entitled, One Thing I Do. That's it. One thing, not two things, not three things, not a whole list of things. One thing I do. The journey toward the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, let's read verses 13 and 14 of chapter 3, the book of Philippians. I'm reading from the New King James Version. <clears throat> Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended or perfected, if you want to call it, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward. Ah, I love that word. Reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. In 1994, Annie and I had the wonderful privilege of attending the North American Conference for Itinerant Evangelists held in Louisville, Kentucky under the auspices of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Several hundreds of people came and just about every evangelist, major evangelist in the country was there. All the big names were there. And on the opening night, the keynote message was delivered by Dr. Billy Graham. But before I let you in what he said, which stuck with me all these years, at the end of the conference, there was a panel discussion. And during the panel discussion, one of the panelists was the representative, the evangelist representative of the Assemblies of God by the name Dr. Jimmy Davis. Now, Jimmy Davis was asked, 
Do you have any suggestions for this evangelist who have gathered here from all over the United States? He said, he said yes, yes, I do. And he said, evangelist, this is my suggestion. Please surprise your wives once in a while with a new message. <laughs> you know, because traveling evangelists, you know, That's all I need to say. <laughs> but here's the point. On the keynote address, Dr. Billy Graham made a statement that really stuck with me all these years. He said when he started out as a young evangelist, he had about 250 evangelistic sermons that he could choose from to preach on. Then he said, at age 75, now, I'm down to eight or 10. He said, those are the only sermons that I preached. And everything that I want to tell people are contained in those messages, eight or 10. And then he said, every time I get up to speak, all my associates who are sitting on the platform are wondering which one of those eight or 10 he's going to be preaching tonight. <laughs> Why do I say that? I say that to impress upon you that with time, with the passing of time, life has a way of bringing to focus what is most important and consequential. You see, when you are very early in life, everything is important to you, isn't it? But as you age, as you progress in life, in your Christian walk with God, you come down to what is the most important and consequential in your life. And I believe as Paul approached the end of his life, he came down to focusing and doing one thing. That one thing is to reach the goal of the price of the upward call of God or to be Christ-like. Paul recognized that while he had considerable progress in Christian journey, he had not arrived at the Christian ideal. And what is that Christian ideal? That Christian ideal is to be like Christ. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. And Paul recognized that he had not arrived at that Christian ideal or attained a complete knowledge of Christ. He knew he was a work in progress. And the purpose of God for which he was apprehended by God or was gotten hold of by God was still being unfolded in his life. The struggle against sin, fear, Doubt was not over yet. But Paul was not discouraged. He was not deterred. He said, I am determined like a laser beam. I'm focused. I'm determined to reach that goal for which Christ has apprehended me. And what was that? It was to know Christ more and more in the fullness to be like him in character and to live his earthly life in the power of his resurrection. What about you? Do you have an idea as to what is the overarching purpose for which Christ has saved you? Do you know, my dear brothers and sisters, do you know where you're headed, what your destination is? Many years ago, when Albert Einstein was serving as the professor of physics at Princeton University, great renowned physicist of the 20th century, Albert Einstein was on a train heading someplace. And uh, as the train was going, the conductors came by to collect the ticket from Einstein. And Einstein looked for his ticket in the pocket, couldn't find it. He looked in the 
bag that he had. He couldn't find it. And the uh, conductor said, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are. You're the great scientist at Princeton. Don't worry about it. I know you have the ticket. Don't even worry about it. And he moved on. And he went to other passengers. And then about an hour later, he came by. And you saw Einstein still searching. And the conductor was rather bemused by his searching continuously. And at this point in time, he was literally on his hands and knees looking for the ticket under the bench in front of it. And under his own bench. And the conductor said, Dr. Einstein, please, don't worry about it. I trust you. You have the ticket. And Einstein looked at him and said, Mr., it's not a matter of trust. It is a matter of direction. I don't know where I am going. <laughs> Do you know where you're going? Hmm? What is the overarching purpose for which Christ found you? John wrote this. He said, when Christ is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. There you have the epitome of our journey. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The overarching purpose of God in saving us is to form us, to conform us and to transform us into the image of his son. In third century BC, a man by the name Aristides wrote a letter to his brother Philocrates to let him know about some of the circumstances surrounding the translation of the Old Testament into the Greek language. And um, in that letter, he made a very insightful statement. He said, life is rightly guided when the pilot knows the goal toward which he must make his way. Paul had a clear view in his mind as to what his final destination was. So must we. Jesus told the rich young ruler, an important statement that contained this expression, one thing. In fact, if you look into that beautiful little expression, two words, one thing, it has a sublime history of usage in the New Testament. Jesus saw the rich young ruler and he said, one thing you're lacking. One thing you're lacking. He looked at Martha and she said, one thing is needed. And Mary took that one thing. The blind man whom Jesus healed, he said, one thing I know, not two things, not three things, not four things. One thing I know, once I was blind, but now I see. The apostle Peter, writing his letter to the church, he said, forget not this one thing. In the eyes of God, a thousand years is like a single day. But if you really think about it though, your entire Christian life can be distilled into one thing. Do you know that? In fact, I dare to say it can be distilled into one word. That one word is faith. The just shall live by faith. That's it. Not only that, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith. And this journey toward that mark that God has set for us involves three very important movements. The movement number one is, we must forget what is behind us. In verse 13, Paul writes, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, 
but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Paul uses the imagery of a foot race in the Greco-Roman culture of his day. The racer would stand at the starting line, his eyes are fixed on the finish line, and his body is bent forward, and he is waiting for the signal to run or to walk. And this foot race is a very important athletic event, and he cannot afford to lose it or, or, or fail making the finish line. So he is not mindful of anything on the right side or on the left side. He dare not even look at the back because to do so might cost his race. So Paul is using this beautiful imagery of a foot racer to drive the point that we must not look at what is behind us in our Christian walk with God. And Paul is saying, forgetting those things which are behind, I move forward. Now when Paul said forgetting those things which are behind, what did he mean by that? He doesn't mean, or he did not mean, that we need to erase our past memories. Aristotle, I believe, was the one who said so beautifully, he said, memory is the scribe of the soul. And we need memory to commune with our hearts. And we need memory to recall the goodness of God in the past. Oh, I can tell you, as I stand before you here, there are, I can honestly tell you, Oftentimes, I am moved by the memory of how God sustained me in the United States of America for the last 57 years. I came into this country with nothing in my hands, $8 to be exact, and a suitcase. And that's all the possession that I had when I landed at SeaTac International Airport in Seattle. And the rest is history. And the rest is a tribute to the faithfulness of God. But I need to remember that once in a while so that I can move forward with confidence and trust in the Lord. Yes, we need memory. But what Paul was really saying here is that I'm not going to let my past, good or bad, impede with my progress in life toward my goal. Paul had a great background. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews of the tribe of Benjamin, studied at the feet of Gamaliel, the great Hebrew scholar, rabbi. He had great pedigree, but he said, you know what? I'm not going to dwell on that past because to do so is to breed complacency. And then Paul also had a checkered past. He persecuted the church. He was a troublemaker. And yet Paul says, I'm not going to dwell on my checkered past either because to do so is to breed despair. So he chose to forget his past. You know, Lloyd Ogilvy, he's passed now, I mean, he's dead, late Ogilvy, Dr. Ogilvy, used to be the pastor of Hollywood Presbyterian Church. And then he became the uh, senator, uh, I mean, the, the chaplain of the United States Senate. And Dr. Ogilvy, one day was riding in his car and uh, he picked up a young boy scout who was on his way to the camp. And the boy scout had a tightly packed knapsack or backpack on his back. And uh, the boy got into the car, sat beside Dr. Ogilvy and rode with him. After a while, Dr. Ogilvy was a little one was wondering why he didn't bother to take his knapsack off his back and make himself comfortable. And so he said, son, why don't you make yourself comfortable a little bit? Take that knapsack or that backpack off your back and just make yourself comfortable. He said, no, sir. It was hard to put it on. It will be hard to take it off. I just have to have it on my back alone. Leave it alone. Hard to put it on, hard to take it off, so I'm going to ride with my load on my back. There are many Christians in the church like that. They are afraid to drive or ride in the vehicle of God's grace with their knapsack off their backs. 
Instead, they are still carrying it on their backs. They are carrying all of that heavy load, load of re past regrets, past achievements, past failures, past disappointments, past broken promises, past self-righteousness, self all these heavy load, they're still carrying on, on their back. And that's why Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That is true. Once you started this journey with the Lord, don't look back. To do so, you are unfit for the kingdom of God. Now, one aspect of forgetting the past involves forgiving people who have caused you pain and harm. It may be a father, a mother, a husband, a wife, a son, or a daughter, neighbor, employer, employee. Does not mean, doesn't mean anything. Doesn't, you know, it's not limited to these people only. Anybody you must be willing to forgive them unconditionally. In fact, I love the expression used by Dr. Artie Kendall in his book, total forgiveness. Total forgiveness with no limitations put on them. But many Christians are afraid to do that, and so as a result of that, that unforgiveness, that bitterness, that load, that heavy load on their back is impeding their walk with the Lord impeding their progress in their Christian life. And the Bible teaches that if we don't forget what is behind us, the devil can use our past to bring us under condemnation and cause us to miss what the Lord is doing in the moment in your life. You know that? We should not allow that past to bring us under condemnation. And that is why the Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans 8 verse 1. We can forget what is behind. How do we do that? You know why? We can forget because we have a new past in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the miracle of new birth. We have a new past. One who is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things, including your past, everything is gone. Behold, all things have become new. You know, when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, the Bible says he bore our sins on his back. Have you ever tried to see your own back? Can you? Who can see your own back? Can, can you see your own back? No. If Jesus cannot see his own back and look at our sins, why should you? Why should me? Why should I? See, he bore our sins on his back. And so, the key to forgetting what is behind is to keep your eyes on Jesus. That's it. There is no other secret to it. Oh, I love that old song that once in a while I sing to myself just to strengthen myself. Praise God. That old song is, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things on earth, including my past, including your past, will grow strangely dim, almost to the point of oblivion. Strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. See, there you have it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's the key, folks to forget what is behind. The second movement in this journey is we must not only forget what is behind us, we must focus on what is before us. We must 
focus on what is before us. Notice what Apostle Paul says here. I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Now notice, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. It is not enough to forget what is behind us. We must also focus on what is before us. Paul again uses the imagery of that foot racer, that athlete in the Greco-Roman culture, reaching forward to the finish line. You know, the, the runner actually leans forward and strains himself toward that mark. Likewise, we must reach forward. Keep reaching on to that mark. To know Christ fully, be like him in character, and live in his power, we need to reach forward. You know, in verse 12, Paul says, I have not attained this level of perfection or Christ-likeness, but he says, I am not deterred. I am not discouraged. I am determined to strain to achieve it. Now, Paul uses actually in his writings some of this very, what he called, uh, emotive and as well as very action-oriented words. For example, here he's using the word reaching out, all right? Straining forward. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says to Timothy, exercise yourself toward godliness. You know, that word exercise comes from the Greek word gumnazo. And that word gumnazo from which we get the English word gymnasium. Yes. See, he said exercise. Do you know that in the ancient days, these athletes in the ancient days exercise literally naked? Yeah, they had no clothes on them. Really, because they didn't want any of the clothes entangled, get entangled with them or they, they don't want to be entangled with the clothes while they are exercising. Exercise yourself toward godliness. Jude uses another action word. Contending for the faith. Contending for the faith. That contending word, English translation, is of the Greek word that is agonizomai, from which we get the English word agony. Need to agonize. You see, so these words like agony or striving, laboring fervently, exercising, contending, all these words point to a very important part of our Christian journey, post-conversion. And that part of our Christian journey, past conversion, is called sanctification. Right. And the purpose of sanctification is to move you day by day toward Christ-likeness. And it is a traumatic experience. It can. Because you see, during that sanctification process, God is chipping away the rough edges of your life. And when that happens, it can be painful. But God will give us the grace to endure it. Because he's the master sculptor working on you to bring forth the image of his son, Jesus Christ, in your life. You see, salvation is what theologians call monergistic. Mono means single, ergon means work. So it is the singular work of God. Salvation is of the Lord, the Bible says very clearly. There is nothing we can contribute toward our salvation. For we are saved by grace through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is monergistic, singular work of God. But sanctification is synergistic. Sun means together, ergon, work. We work together with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, toward that end goal of Christ likeness. We must focus on the goal before us and pursue it like a hunter pursues his prey. Like a hunter pursuing his prey. 
But the problem, you know, that we have really is we are creatures so prone to distraction. In fact, we love to be distracted. Yeah. So we can avoid doing the real thing, you know. We just want to go the rabbit trails, you know. See? We want to be distracted. Think of how easily we can be distracted. Have you ever tried to spend a time, some time with the, with the Lord in prayer? Huh? Just think about that for a moment. Immediately you can think of all the emails you need to respond to. Huh? All the grocery things that you need to buy right away, you know? Everything becomes very important. The whole list will flood your mind and you're distracted. It's the same situation when it comes to reading the word of God or whatever things we want to do to grow in our spiritual life. I think it was Richard Foster who said it so beautifully. He said this. In contemporary society, our adversary majors in three things. Noise, hurry, and crowds. Those are the three things that our adversary, the devil, he majors in. Noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us engaged in muchness and manyness, he will rest satisfied. I think it was psychiatrist Carl Jung once remarked, hurriedness or hurry is not of the devil, it is the devil. <laughs> Distractions, you know, gain power over our lives, not by its indomitable force, but by our divided heart. Let me repeat that statement. Distraction gains power over our lives, not by its indomitable force, but by our own divided heart. And God can give us the grace to pursue him with an undivided heart and overcome distractions and other sinful behaviors that slow us down or make us fall. You know, in the ancient Greco-Roman culture, this uh, uh, athlete or this foot racer was assigned a lane. He has to stay in that lane and run in that lane. He cannot afford to look at somebody on the next lane or two lanes away. He has to focus on his own lane and what is before him to avoid all kinds of distractions. God has given each one of us a lane to make our race, to run our race. My lane is not your lane. Your lane is not my lane. I have a lane. I need to remain faithful in that lane. And so one way to keep focused on the things before us is to be faithful in doing things are at hand now in your life, faithfully. And those things can may, can may relate to your professional life, it may relate to family life. It may relate to your finances. It may relate to your spiritual formation. It may relate to your, your church life. Doesn't matter. There is a lane for you to run, and there are tasks to be done at hand. And you have to be faithful in doing so. You know, Paul had this great goal, right? But he had a task at hand, and he never neglected it. Do you know what that task was? to preach the gospel. That was his calling, that was his assignment, and he never neglected it. In fact, he said, I made it my aim to go and preach where the name of Christ has not been mentioned before. So he knew his task at hand. Remember Moses? Oh, Moses was so busy mending, I mean, uh, shepherding the flock, in the Midian desert. That was the task at hand. He was faithful in doing it. But while he was doing the task at hand faithfully, God called him for a higher assignment. Let me tell you something. God is never known to use a lazy person. 
God is never known to use a lazy person. Be faithful in doing the task at hand, whatever it is. Remember Gideon? Yeah. He was also very busy doing the task at hand. And what was that? Threshing the grain, threshing the wheat at the bottom of the wine press. He was just doing his thing faithfully. And God said, that's it. He's the man I need. And called him for a higher purpose and a higher task. Remember the widow of Zarephath that Elijah met? She had just about little flour and little oil to make a couple of pancakes for herself and for son and dad. And so she, think about it for a minute. She could have said, listen, this is the end of my life. I'm going to die anyway, so what's the point? I'm just going to lay in bed and just die. But she had a task at hand. And what was that task at hand? Get up in the morning, go gather some sticks to make that last meal. And when she was busy doing the task at hand, she had an encounter with the God of Israel through Elijah and experienced the provision of God in ways that she had never imagined or dreamed before in her life. All because she was faithful in doing the task at hand. That is, get up in the morning and go around gathering some sticks. And God opened an opportunity for her to have a, 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 a change in, her, in the course of her life. If she had just remained in the bed, it would have never happened. Jesus called his disciples when they were busy doing the task at hand. They were mending nets. They were fishing. And God, Jesus said, come on now. That's enough. I have a higher assignment for you. Follow me. One day, John Wesley was asked by a lady. You all know John Wesley, right? The founder of Methodism. And uh, this lady asked John Wesley, Reverend Wesley, if you knew and God told you tomorrow midnight you're going to die, what would you do differently? How would it change your attitude? You knew or you know that you're going to die tomorrow at midnight. What difference will it make in your life? Do you know what he said? This is what he said. Why, madam, just as I intend to spend it now, I would preach this evening at Gloucester and again at 5 tomorrow morning. After that, I would ride to Twixbury, preach in the afternoon, and meet the societies in the evening. I would then go to Reverend Martin's house, who expects to entertain me, talk and pray with the family as usual, retire to my room at 10 o'clock, commend myself to my heavenly Father, lie down and rest and wake up in glory. <laughs> what a beautiful... He said, it's not going to change anything. Even if I knew tomorrow midnight I'm going to die. I'm going to go about doing faithfully the task at the hand. And one of them happens to be having a cup of tea with Reverend Martin. So what kind of a task at hand are you neglecting right now? Even as I'm speaking to you. I want you to do a real soul searching. What are some of the tasks that you are neglecting? You may think it is of no significance. But if you want God to use you in any very special way, be faithful in doing a task at hand. Let me give you an example of this. Three months ago, four months ago, a relative of mine contacted me with a very important question, which I pretty much never bothered to even think about. The question was, what is the fate of those who never heard 
the name of Jesus or the gospel? Many people are afraid to tackle that question because, you know, we don't know what the mind of God is in these matters, especially when the text, when the scripture is not very plain, very clear about some of these issues. But that put me on a journey. I said, you know what, I need to really think about this thing because I never really thought intently, intensely and intently uh, about this question. So I went on a journey of researching the subject, studying it as much as I could. And I know that there is no consensus among scholars on this matter. That's what I concluded based on my own research. But the bottom line is this. At the end of that journey, I wrote a book of 100 pages. And that book, this morning, got released by Amazon.com. And that book is entitled, The Eskimos Conundrum, The Fate of Those Who Never Heard the Gospel. But here's the important thing. It's just not, it's just not the idea of writing a book. The idea is that I learned and learned to appreciate more about the grace of God, the wonder of the gospel, and so many other things that I never grasped or appreciated before. Task at hand, whatever it is, be faithful. And finally, the movement number three. We must foresee what is beyond us. Not only forget what is behind us, focus what is before us and foresee what is beyond us. And notice what Paul says. I press toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul is essentially saying, brothers and sisters, we must live our lives here on earth with an eternal perspective. That's it. With an eternal perspective. See beyond the temporal. For Paul, that meant the heavenly reward that is to be conferred upon him at the end of the race when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed. And he uses a very interesting Greek word there and that word literally means winner's prize. You know, in the old days, in the Greco-Roman culture, when these foot racers are, they win a, a, a race and the judge will stand up and the judge will announce publicly the name of the winner the country that he represents and his father's name and then gives him a perishable prize of a palm tree branch. That's it. And that is why Paul said, you know, these guys, you know, work so hard for a perishable crown. But we, an imperishable crown. And what is that imperishable crown? It is the full revelation of Jesus Christ and the transformation of our body that it may be conformed to the Christ's glorious body. That's why we read in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, for our citizenship is in heaven. That is looking beyond. That is having that eternal perspective. What is beyond us? For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Brothers and sisters, beloved, let us run our race with an eternal perspective. Never lose sight of that. One day, all our applause will subside. I guarantee you that. All our awards will tarnish. I guarantee you that. All our achievements will be forgotten. I guarantee you that. All our certificates will be buried with us. You can have a whole wall full of certificates. but They'll be all buried with us. But what will remain forever is the accolade that we get from the Lord himself. Well done, good, and thou faithful servant of the Lord. 
That's the reward. That is eternal, unperishable. You know, when Stephen was being stoned to death, have you noticed that? He saw the heavens open. He had a deep gaze into heaven. And he saw something very interesting. He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. The normal position of Jesus is to be seated at the right hand of the Father. But on this occasion, oh, Jesus said, that's my candidate. That's the winner of the prize. I've got to stand up and give him a heavenly applause, heavenly accolade. So he stood up and recognized Stephen as the winner of the price of the upward call of God. So dear brothers and sisters, do you foresee what is beyond you? Abraham waited for that city whose builder and maker is God. You know, I have a little book in my library. It's uh, written by um, a 20th century Scottish theologian by the name John Bailey. And it is a prayer, a collection of his prayers. And there is one prayer that he prayed that just captured my heart. This is how he wrote this prayer. He said, help me, O Lord God, not to let my thoughts today be wholly occupied by the world's passing show. In your loving kindness, you have given me the power to lift my mind to contemplate the unseen and eternal. Help me not to remain content only with what I see and feel here and now. Instead, grant that each day may do something to strengthen my grasp of the unseen world and my sense of the reality of that world. And so, as the end of my earthly life draws ever nearer, bind my heart to the holy interests of that unseen world so that I may not grow to be a part of these fleeting earthly surroundings, but instead, grow more and more ready for the life of the world to come. That's why the Bible says, set your mind on the things above and not on the things on earth. But let me quickly conclude here with this beautiful verse. You know, Paul wrote something that just touched my heart and really grasped me. And it is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, toward the end of I mean, chapter 3, verse 18, and then moves on into the first part or first verse of chapter 4, verse 1. But he said something very profound. Do you know what he said? He said this, And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more, more, more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Now notice, going into verse uh, uh, 1 of chapter 4, Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this ministry, we never give up. Do you know what Paul is saying? You know, today we, we scurry around the world trying to find a ministry to do. Now we all want to do a ministry. But let me tell you what the supreme ministry that every one of us should be doing. And that ministry is to be transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why Paul is saying this. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Therefore, since God in His mercy has given us this ministry, we never give up. That's the supreme ministry. To be made like Jesus. And the journey that we take toward that goal requires forgetting what is behind us Focusing on what is before us and foreseeing what is beyond us. So we may say, Lord, how do we do that? Humanly, it's not possible. No question about that. If you try to do it in your own strength, you're going to fall flat after a week. One week you might get, make it. Maybe. maybe a couple of days. But after that, it's a losing battle. So you know that we cannot do it on our own. We have to trust the Lord for that. And that's where Paul himself answers the question.
How do we do it? Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> the rest I'm not going to say. Don't worry. You know what Paul says? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's it. I can do all things, even this, forgetting what is behind, focusing on what is before, and foreseeing what is beyond. All of that I can do. All things through Christ who strengthens me. By his grace, we can continuously pursue Christ's likeness with an undivided heart. In ourselves, we are weak. No questions about that. But Jesus said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Praise God. So when you feel helpless and weak, oh, you are the right candidate for God to move in in your life. Let me let you in a little secret. God is always attracted to weakness. God is always attracted to weakness. Let's close our eyes in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Some of you are, in fact, many of you, perhaps, all of you perhaps, are born again, and, and you have been serving the Lord. But along the way, you have lost that vision about that one thing that needed to be done. Perhaps as a result of hearing this message, Maybe God is speaking to your heart to realign yourself and sharpen your focus on that one thing. And that is to make that journey toward Christ's likeness in your life. Forgetting what is behind, focusing what is before, and foreseeing what is beyond. And so I pray that the Lord would minister to your heart and empower you to make that commitment. Then there are people here perhaps who are alien to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in terms of salvation. You may be outside God's salvation, but Jesus is inviting you to receive him as your Lord and Savior so you can begin that journey yourself toward that upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But whatever the state you may be in tonight, God is speaking to you. and I pray that your heart will be moved and touched and that you would make a determination to press on toward that grand goal of becoming like Jesus Christ. Amen. Perhaps we Praise the Lord. A good word to us today. Even though we're to forget what is behind the first point, don't forget the message today. Let it, let it marinate into your heart, your spirit, your lives. Amen. And uh, then we focus on the task at hand. And we are an eternally oriented people. We've, we, we foresee what is beyond. Amen. So thank you again, our dear brother, for, uh, as I said earlier, just consistently a good word anytime he ministers. So let's not forget it. Let's stand in the house of the Lord today. A uh, good word from Glenn, uh, Glenn Reynolds last week, from our own brother Abraham this week. I look forward to being back with you right here next Sunday. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the good word that we've heard today. And we do want to receive it in our hearts and take it with us and let it make a difference in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Just before you go, I know he referenced, if anyone has not received the salvation of the Lord yet, but you, you sense something in your heart, I'm going to be right down here front for a little while. Come and see me. Come and talk to me. I'd love to chat with you and pray with you. God bless you. Have an awesome week. We'll see you right back here next Sunday.
If you've never visited us at Five Rivers, we want to invite you to this week's services with ministry for the entire family. For location information, visit us online at fiveriverschurch.com.